Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you, as well as our good friends from C-SPAN, to the William G. McGowan Theater, located in the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. I'm Doug Swanson, the Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum, as well as the producer for the Noontime Lecture Series. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to remind you of some other programs that will be taking place in this location coming up in the near future. On October 21st and 22nd, starting at 10 a.m., we'll hold our annual virtual genealogy fair where you can learn online about using federal records for family history research. To learn more about this event and how you can participate, please visit uh, the website www.archives.gov slash calendar slash genealogy hyphen fair. Then on Thursday, October 22nd at 7 p.m., we will hold a discussion on the history and impact of alcohol regulation. So to find out more about these and our other programs and our exhibits, please take one of our monthly event calendars, which you'll find in the racks in the, th excuse me, in the theater lobby, or you can visit our website at www.archives.gov calendar. Our topic for today is the Settler's Year, Pioneer Life Through the Seasons by Kathleen Ernst. Kathleen is a social historian, educator, and the best-selling award-winning author of 33 published books that have sold over 1.6 million copies. A Settler's Year, Pioneer Life Through the Seasons, was selected by the Library of Congress Center for the book to represent Wisconsin at the National Book Festival. The book features photographs taken at Old World Wisconsin, the nation's largest historic site dedicated to rural life where Kathleen worked as a curator and, in, I'm sorry, curator of interpretation and collections for over a decade. Her experiences there formed a settler's year and inspired Kathleen's Chloe Elfson Historic Sites Mystery Series for Adults. Kathleen's first nonfiction title was Too Afraid to Cry, Maryland Civilians in the Antietam Campaign. It earned her a U.S. National Park Service invitation to speak at the ceremonies marking the 150th anniversary of the battle. A copy of Too Afraid to Cry was included in the battlefield's time capsule to be opened at the 200th anniversary of the battle. Kathleen has also written many historic novels for young readers, as well as television scripts, one of which earned her an Emmy, poetry, and essays. She also has a master's degree in history, education, and writing from Antioch University, where her self-designed program focused on non-traditional methods of teaching and learning history. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen Erst to the National Archives. Thank you. I am delighted and honored to be here at the National Archives. Thank you all for coming, and special thanks to Doug Swanson and his colleagues here for making this program possible. As Doug mentioned, uh, my first nonfiction book was set in Maryland. I grew up in Maryland, and Too Afraid to Cry, I was looking for the stories of the civilians during the Antietam campaign and, and the whole war. And that was the first time that I was able to make use of the study collections here at the National Archives as I looked at uh, accounts that people filed for damages after the armies had moved through. And I'm so enormously grateful that so many of our national treasures are protected here at the National Archives. I have now lived in Wisconsin, however, for over 30 years. And I'm here today to talk about another topic that's very dear to my heart. And that's the immigrant experience in Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. So I hope that you can uh, use your imagination a little bit. I'd like to set the stage and think about how you would feel 150 years ago if you were preparing, especially to leave Europe, for a new land that you could only vaguely imagine. On a breezy, salt-scented day in the 19th century, a group of Bohemian immigrants with tear-stained cheeks leaned over the railing of their ship, the ship that would take them to America. Someone started singing an old folk song, Where is my home? Husky voice, they all joined in, and they watched as their last glimpse of their homeland faded into the horizon behind them. On another day, at another dock, an Irish boy with haunted eyes and hollow cheeks also boarded a ship. He did not look back at the land that was so desperately ravaged by potato blight and famine. Pinned inside his pocket was a note that his mother had written just before she died. 
It contained the name, she had scribbled on the scrap of paper, the name of an uncle that the boy had never met, and one single compass word, Wisconsin. On a different dock, several German women gave tail ends of fat balls of homespun yarn to their weeping and shawl-wrapped mothers and sisters before boarding their ship. When the ship left her moorings, the yarn unspooled until each of the women on that ship felt her end slip from her fingers. It was the last ephemeral link to everything dear and familiar. Sometime later, a Swedish farmer who was deep in debt chose a, moonlit night, a moonless night to slip from home and make his way to the nearest port. He left his family with nothing but a promise to send passage money when he could, if he could. Where is my home? As the old folk song asked. That question haunted thousands of Europeans a century and more ago. Between 1836 and 1850, Wisconsin's population rose from 11,000 to over 305,000. But behind those statistics are more than 294,000 unique people, each with her or his own hopes and heartaches, each with his or her own story. A Settler's Year tells stories about European and Yankee immigrants who made their journey in the 19th and early 20th centuries, people dreaming of and searching for and working to create new homes in a new land. And although this book focuses on the experience of Wisconsin's many immigrants, it does reflect the broader heritage of the Upper Midwest and really our entire nation. Uh, it's a story, these stories have relevance for almost all of us. Most of us either are immigrants ourselves or have an immigration story on our family tree. And I think today it's very difficult for us to even imagine what it was truly like for Europeans to leave their home in the 1800s, knowing that they would probably never see their homeland again or the people that they loved, knowing that communications would be extremely difficult in the new world. The stereotypical view is that men were the ones who were eager to seek out new horizons and new opportunities while women were reluctant to immigrate and often looked over their shoulders as they left. But that was not always the case. Johann Schuster of Bavaria succumbed to gnawing doubts the night before his family was going to depart. We know how things are here, he cried. Germany, we know. America is an unknown country to us. His wife replied kindly but firmly, Johan, tomorrow we are leaving for America. Surviving the ocean crossing was a challenge, but only the first part of the journey. And newcomers traveled on canal boats, on sloops, or on steamships, in rattling train cars, or in plodding, rumbling wagons. Once they reached Wisconsin, a few of the new, new arrivals did settle in Milwaukee or Green Bay or Sheboygan or one of the other ports on the eastern side of the state. But the majority of people kept going. They moved out to explore prairie and wooded landscapes. In 1850, less than 10% of the people living in Wisconsin were urban dwellers. Now also traveling from the eastern seaboard were what people we call Yankees. These were men and women of English descent from the British Isles. Many were third or fourth generation Americans. Now perhaps they were restless, perhaps they were adventurous, perhaps they were already feeling confined as the populations were growing and land prices were rising in their own area. So for whatever reason, they too left their friends and their family and decided to try their luck on what was then the western frontier. The Yankees, in general, brought a zeal for civic improvement and a strong dedication to a democratic government. Although far fewer in number, free blacks also traveled from eastern cities in search of a new home. A few other African Americans fled slavery in the south and found sanctuary in the remote hills of southwestern Wisconsin. 
Now, all those people who were dreaming of agricultural opportunities were not the first to arrive in the area, of course. Early French explorers and traders had managed to meet the Native Americans who were living there without causing too much harm or displacing them. The tragic clash between United States government land policy and the Indians' way of life came to an end in Wisconsin with the Black Hawk War in 1832. After that, with most Native people push for, pushed from their homes, the new pioneers found land available. The immigrants who did arrive had a lot to do with the succeeding waves that followed them. Uh, you've probably heard the term America letters. They would write letters home extolling the virtues of the land and what they had found here. And these tattered letters would make their way in some small village in Sweden or Norway or Germany from hand to hand as people read what had been written by someone that they knew and trusted. And many states, like many states, Wisconsin also officially encouraged immigration for a short time. In a few cases, people were even able to uh, go back and recruit people from their own home village if they wanted to create a bigger community in Wisconsin of people that they knew. Then in 1862, the Homestead Act brought more settlers to the upper Midwest with the promise of 160 acres of public land in exchange for a certain period of residency and other requirements. In Wisconsin, over 3 million acres were claimed by over 29,000 homesteaders. And the records that document these transactions are contained here at the National Archives. In the very earliest years of settlement in Wisconsin, European settlers hoped to arrive in the summer when there was still time to look around, uh, perhaps if they had some money to actually buy a little piece of land or to find someone to go to work for if they arrived with absolutely nothing. The challenge with arriving in the summer was that hot weather and very crowded conditions in the immigrant cabins because people often opened their doors uh, as newcomers arrived contributed to devastating epidemics in some of the earliest immigrant settlements. For other immigrants, uh, capricious winds as they were crossing the ocean or other challenges or obstacles delayed them from arriving. And it was not uncommon for immigrants to arrive in Wisconsin in October or November or December. It was the 26th of November, 1835, that I first set foot in Wisconsin, wrote Isaac T. Smith. The weather was extremely cold with one foot of snow upon the ground. I was in company with some families consisting of women and small children, some of the latter but a few months old. And Mr. Smith's party had to camp as they were tra traversing through Wisconsin. Imagine camping in Wisconsin winter in 1835 with an infant. But they did want to go out and see the land, and sometimes winter conditions made it better for them to get a sense of the landscape. Whether borrowed, bartered from a speculator in 1842, obtained from the federal government 20 years later, or purchased from a northern lumber company several decades after that, the newcomers mostly wanted land of their own. A settler's year, pioneer life through the seasons, is organized to help readers imagine the cycles that immigrants experienced. All of the photographs were taken at Old World, Wisconsin. And unless otherwise noted, the images were captured by my colleague, Lloyd Heath. The photo essays were intended to depict the agricultural year. And as I started working on this book and reading accounts and, and delving into the primary resources, it seemed to me that the agricultural year also was a metaphor for a cycle that most immigrants went through starting with arriving in sometimes very challenging and brutal conditions, and hopefully completing the circle to getting their feet on the ground and being content with their decision to immigrate. So a settler's year covers both of those cycles. And what I'd like to do now is give you a taste of some of the stories and photos as they're depicted in a settler's year. Now today, we tend to think of spring as it's a wonderful time. Things are green. The winter is, is fading into the background. In the very earliest years of settlement, when provisions were often very low and harvest was still many, many, many months away, spring was often a very challenging time for the new arrivals. 
as frost left the soil, families went out and started carving their farm from the native natural landscape as best they could. Most in the beginning had nothing to work with but perhaps a few simple hand tools such as a heavy grub hoe. When they could afford it, they would buy an oxen, usually the first animal that the settlers wanted and sometimes families would even pool their resources to buy an oxen or a team of oxen. And oxen were helpful for many reasons. They were wonderful animals for pulling a cart to the market or um, other heavy duties, skidding logs through the woods in the wintertime. But one of the biggest challenges was turning prairie land into farmland. Prairie plants have very deep roots. They're very dense, often matted together. And it might take two or three teams of oxen hitched to a single scouring plan plow to overturn the soil. Another problem with oxen, uh, challenge with oxen, is that they often ran away. They had a mind of their own, especially if, if the people who bought them really weren't used to working with oxen. And it was not at all uncommon for people to spend many hours struggling with it to turn land and, and plow. And then once, as soon as the oxen were unhitched, the oxen would run away. It was a daily happening, and they'd spend two more hours trying to get their oxen to come back to the farm. Now, one of the things that immigrants did, whether Yankee or European, was they would bring uh, seeds, sometimes cuttings, even plants if they could, if they were coming from the New England area, so that they could have a little tiny sense of place in their new home that reminded them of their old home. I have sown flower seed, dear father, and am looking forward to flowers like a child, wrote Sophie Seifert in 1856. We even started an asparagus bed. So we are introducing German vegetables little by little while the American lives on cake, meat, and potatoes all year. Another German immigrant wrote, the Americans leave their cattle out in the open summer and winter and sometimes the milk freezes in the udder. I could not bring myself to do that. So the cattle barn was the first building to be erected on our new farm and echoed a third German, Americans must come to appreciate fertilization, crop rotation, and the value of remaining in one location. Now those immigrants struck a common theme, uh, a different way that the Europeans and the Yankees tended to view the landscape at that time. I don't think the assessment was totally fair that they made that uh, Americans only lived on cake and potatoes and meat. But Yankee settlers did have, in general, a different approach to agriculture. They were often very quick to adopt the latest mechanical innovations, and they were much more likely to consider short-term profits. They did know from experience that if a field got worn out or things became crowded, they could always move on farther west, as they had already done at least one time, and sometimes many hopscotched across the country. The Europeans, who had made such a more difficult journey crossing the Atlantic, they tended to look at both their land and their livestock in a different way. So if they had uh, precious baby pigs in the spring, for example, and weather got cold, they wouldn't think twice about building a pen inside their own one-room cabin to make sure that they were protected. They were also much more conscious about crop rotation and fertilization and things like that. But whether Yankee or European, spring did bring the promise of better times. And with sunshine warming their shoulders, immigrants continued or began the hard work of creating new homes in this new place. One descendant noted, it took courage to plant a settlement. But with tiny seeds and breaking plows and red geraniums, the settlers tried to face the challenges. They dreamed of abundance despite quivering muscles blistered palms, and sometimes homesick hearts. When spring softened the landscape, all things did seem possible. Now, when summer came, the farmers eyed the sky, as farmers all over the globe continue to do, hoping for just the right amount of rain, not too much, not too little. Women checked their garden plots every day, looking for new growth, but also looking for any sign of insect pests that might devastate one of their carefully tended crops. 
At this point, once the planning was done, so much of their success now depended largely on factors beyond their control. Now you may think of Wisconsin as a dairy state. We're proud of that, that name. But at the time that we're talking about in the mid-1800s, actually the most important crops were grain. They were vitally important. What we would not give for our ordinary barley groats and cut barley, barley, one immigrant lamented. The Americans do not know how to grind grain, and our Swedish stomachs sigh in vain for our beloved porridge. Most farmers did plant rye and oats for their own home use. That's what they were used to. But long before the dairy industry did emerge in Wisconsin, wheat was literally a golden cash crop. Thousands and thousands of prairie acres were plowed under and sown with wheat. In the days of hand tools, harvesting all that wheat was a challenge. The best gleaners could cut about four acres a day, but that took a lot of practice. When I first began to cradle wheat, I thought my ribs should break the next morning when I started in again, wrote, recalled Frederick Hanna Yeager, a Prussian immigrant who arrived in 1854. Cut grain had to be raked and then bound into bundles, shocked and stacked all by hand. And it wasn't just the men that were working outside. Uh, European women were, were often very comfortable and used to working in the fields and doing heavy labor. Um, but certainly some of the Yankee women also in the early years realized that if the farm was going to get started, they needed to, to get to work also. One pioneer noted of a neighbor, Mrs. Nass has always been a persistent worker in the fields. Her husband cradled the grain and she bound it. When she could not do her housework in the daytime because of the press of outside duties, she did it at night after supper and the chores were done. And I need to fill you in that Mrs. Nass, while doing all of that, raised 18 children. So not only was she doing heavy farm work with babies to tend and toddlers underfoot, she was pregnant most of the time. Children often attended school in the summer, which would probably horrify our children today. But it was the easiest time to spare them from home. During those hottest months, the planting had already been done. The frenzy of the big harvest had not begun. So children were sent to school if there was one to send them to. And before schoolhouses were even officially established, it was very common for families to pool their resources in one parent would say, send everybody in the neighborhood to me. We'll have classes in our cabin until we can get a school teacher hired and a little bit more official. But the children also learned that very young children also had work to do on a busy farm. So as soon as they were able to toddle around, they were usually set to gathering wood chips to bring in for kindling. Or another favorite chore was uh, setting the children out in the grain fields, because if blackbirds came in or crows, uh, and, and started to threaten the grain, the children would run up and down the rows for hours, chasing away the birds. And sometimes when the cows or oxen ran away, the older children were sent to find them, which I don't think was always a hard job. One man wrote that uh, whenever he went, as a boy, went chasing oxen, he, he managed to go by way of the swimming hole so that he could have a little fun on the way. As summer's sticky heat faded, Everyone took a deep breath and took stock of where they were. Some dreams had already been shattered by hailstorms or grasshoppers or drought. Sometimes they found chinch bugs in the grain or caterpillars in the cabbage. Sometimes even a strong man's desires had limits and a hardy woman's determination did not prevail. But other dreams literally bore fruit, as evidenced by wash tubs of beans and crocks of, of cucumbers and pickles and barns filled to the rafters. My farm is thriving, John Curler wrote home to Germany in 1852. In addition to God's blessing, our work has not been in vain. <clears throat> now in the early years of settlement, Families all, often worked all fall to thresh their wheat or other grain crops. 
Again, people with very little access to tools or agricultural innovations did everything by hand. Men without barn floors, like this gentleman, spread sheets on the ground or canvas tarps. And you put bundles of grain on the floor, the threshing floor, and circle with the flail that you can see there. And what the men are doing is literally beating the little kernels of grain from the stalks. It's a long operation. Other men drove oxen in endless rounds on the bundles of grain to trample the seed heads free. Once that work was done, of course, winnowing was still a big job to do by hand because the kernels were not at all clean of the, the chaff and dirt. And without transportation, and many people did not have transportation for quite some time, obtaining supplies or even going to a mill once they threshed their grain was a difficult challenge. One young Belgian woman left home long before dawn with a 60-pound sack of wheat slung over her shoulder. She made a 15-hour, 30-mile trudge to the closest mill. She would get her grain ground into flip on the mill floor, and the next day she would return home with the precious flower slung over her shoulder again. Now that sounds pretty challenging probably for most of us, but her son wrote, it was considered a vacation of sorts. It was a change of motion for her. Harvest suppers were only one of the late season's diversions. Settlers were generally quick to help their neighbors. It made the work go faster, and it certainly uh, added a, a social element to even the most grueling tasks, such as butchering hogs. With the anxious frenzy of the worst of the harvest past, they could afford to take a little bit more time, tell a few stories, visit with their neighbors a little longer. Life was not so easy, recalled one woman. But we always had time for old-fashioned country pleasures. We used to take our work and go and spend all day with the neighbor and real sociable times we had. Children were kept busy in the fall. They helped to empty the gardens, first gathering all the vegetables that grew above ground and then moving on later to the root crops. The vines that twined through the corn stalks and grain and corn stalks sometimes bore enormous fruit on this productive, never farmed before soil. Our pumpkins grow to weigh as much as 30 pounds, one immigrant marveled. My wife could not carry two and had to bring them in one at a time. They are very valuable to us. They make syrup and we also feed them to the cattle which makes them give much milk. So by November, hickory smoke wafted from the smokehouses, apple butter simmered on the stove. There were crocks and barrels in the root cellars. Women counted and recounted and recounted the jars and sacks and crocks of food stored there and in their attics, constantly calculating what they had, what they had left, what it took meet the needs of their family through the coming months. Men also did the same in the barns, eyeing hay and straw, bins of feed corn, barrels of the mangles, which are a big heavy vegetable, and turnips and rutabagas that they set aside for the cows. One man noted that although he and his wife had never been to school, they could calculate as well as anyone else because of the necessity of evaluating their cordwood and their food for, as winter approached. The families had done their best, and ready or not, cold weather was upon them. Now in the earliest years, when some immigrants arrived in Wisconsin, again, literally with nothing but the clothes they were wearing, they left their homeland because they had nothing to look forward to there. They managed to scrape up passage, and they got to Wisconsin by working as a hired hand their way across the country. And some of them had no choice on their first winter but to dig a dugout into the side of a hill and spend the winter in there. And if later arrivals came, they would welcome them in also, which must have been very cramped and smoky and uh, a very long winter for the people inside. Even those with small cabins didn't fare a whole lot better sometimes. Sometimes men got a cabin up, but there was no money or time to put 
glass in the windows, so they had open spaces. Water froze in our glasses on the table, recalled Hannah Parker. And if a little spilled on the floor, it would freeze before we could wipe it up. We had no crib for the baby and had to keep him tied in a chair. Our mother was sick all winter, and we hung quilts and blankets around the stovepipe and fixed her a bed in that enclosure. And some families, as you can see in this slide, didn't even have a stove. They made do with an old-fashioned open hearth. In the cabins that might not have glass or doors yet, women hung rag rugs in the door frame and tacked squares of greased muslin over the window spaces. But as you can imagine, when temperature plunged far below zero, it was impossible to maintain a comfortable heat in the cabins. Not all the people in the house could find a place around the stove at the same time, wrote a Norwegian man. And the ones who got there first enjoyed rights of priority. We almost perished from cold, both indoors and out, during the bitter winter days. And you can imagine a tiny cabin like this, really mobbed with a crush of immigrants. Sometimes in those early years, there were so many people sleeping in one cabin that it was hard to walk across the floor in, in the night because of all the people sleeping. And one man wrote how he and his wife slept in a bed while another couple slept under the bed right beneath them because that was the only space left. Times were challenging not just for the Europeans. A Yankee immigrant remembered another harsh reality for the early settlers. He wrote, only those who have experienced it can imagine the loneliness of a first winter 30 miles from the closest post office. One inconvenience was the lack of matches. One wild and windy night, Mr. Garner's fireplace went out. Soon Mr. Salisbury came over. He too had lost fire. Together they started for Mr. Smith's home to borrow a coal. Mr. Salisbury fell in a river while crossing a fallen tree. While he remained at Smith's to dry his clothing, Mr. Gardner started homeward. After some distance, it occurred to him that the pail seemed light, and he checked and saw that the bottom of the tin pail had melted from the heat of the coals, and he had lost his fire again. Trudging back to the, his neighbor's cabin, neighbor being a relative term, he borrowed an iron kettle, filled it with coals, and succeeded in reaching home to start his fire again. Now, even during the most brutal cold of a Wisconsin winter, one crop always beckoned the new arrivals, and that was timber. One Danish woman recalled, soon it was winter and not having any money, my husband and I had to go to work again. We helped each other to make cord wood for which we, re we received 60 cents a, pound, a cord. We had to wade through snow knee deep, and yet we had to work every day the weather permitted it. It was necessary to live. Men often spent their, much of their winters cutting fence poles in anticipation of the spring, making shingles that they might be able to sell or cutting cordwood to sell as well. And it kept many a family going during those early winters. Another account told of a woman who shouldered an ax like all the women did in those days and went into the woods with her young husband, helping him fell trees and saw logs. She wore men's heavy boots and often the ax would glance off while she was cutting wood and cut her boots. She and her sister-in-law felled trees unassisted by male help for several winters. Despite the grueling labor, many women took satisfaction in their accomplishment and relished being outdoors. And one said that being outdoors and staying busy was warmer than trying to stay warm inside the cabin. As communities were established, Winter did not keep people indoors, including children heading for school. We used to get pretty cold on winter mornings, wandering through the deep snow, and with temperatures 20 or 30 degrees below zero, one girl remembered. But so many of the early immigrants, or all the immigrants, just cherished the idea of education for their children. And summer and winter were the times that they could best be spared from the farm. Young adults cherished winter for another reason, and that was sleigh rides. One man recalled, 
The crack of the driver's whip as the horses started off, the jingle of bells, the sharp, crisp winter air, the joyful songs and the bandying of jokes. Usually, he wrote, you went to some town 15 or 20 miles away, and you probably rode all evening and reached the inn by 1 o'clock in the morning. Then came the oyster stew. You sat around the stove telling stories, singing songs, cracking jokes for a while. Then back home, if you were lucky, and if there weren't any drifts, you got home before dawn. Winter sometimes provided the very busy immigrants a chance to do things that slipped away from them during the warmer months. Uh, perhaps it was a little bit of handwork. Perhaps it was writing long letters to the people that they had left behind. A woman named Emmeline Moulton poured out her homesickness in a letter. You don't know, Aunt Delinda, how anxious I am to go back to dear old Vermont for a visit with all of you. But should we never have the pleasure of meeting again on earth, let us anticipate a joyful meeting in heaven where parting shall be known no more. As the years went by and farms became established, winter was ultimately a time to savor a slower pace, to reflect, to plan for the coming year. The frenzy of the autumn harvest was past. Women and men caught their breath pulled rocking chairs closer to their stoves, and waited for spring. Now, most immigrants agreed that the first year was by far the hardest year in the new world. Everyone that starts on the journey must consider that one must first taste sour before he can drink sweet, cautioned one. And certainly the winter season was especially hard on the newly arrived immigrants who huddled in those dugouts or drafty cabins with nothing to do but wait for spring. But spring did arrive. And counterbalancing the labor and the homesickness and sometimes despair was a spirit of cooperation that pervaded the rural settlements. It helped many pioneers survive that first difficult year. Almost everybody needed some help recalled a black woman who lived in the integrated community of Pleasant Ridge. Immigrants in lonely valleys watched for the next crop of newcomers, even if their own cabin was already crowded. Women often sought the company of other women, and it was not unusual for a newly arrived woman uh, who was struggling to get her feet on the ground to be visited by the closest woman, and even if they did not speak the same language, her neighbor, her new neighbor, would come in and perhaps make a cup of, cup of tea or nod or pat her on the arm enough to say, I understand, and I'm here to help you. Certainly, some dreams died. A few immigrants chose to save their money and return to their homeland. Some immigrants did not live long enough to see their dreams fulfilled, to know if their sacrifices had been in vain or to see their children and grandchildren thrive. However, many settlers did manage with what one man summarized as hard work, indomitable pluck, and a rigid economy to create farms, good farms, that would provide for their descendants. Those traits were ultimately found on thousands of farms throughout Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. There was not a distinct pioneer era in Wisconsin. At a time when some of the earliest settlers in the southeastern corner of the state were smiling upon the fruits of decades of labor, later arrivals were moving up into the cutover land where timber companies had moved through, cut the timber, and just left acres and acres of stumps. And the Finns and Swedes who settled up in that area were starting their own pioneer era decades after the first Yankees and some of the Europeans had arrived. German immigrant John Curler spoke for many of those who had sacrificed and planned and worked and stuck it out through the hard times. Of all my former occupations, he wrote, there was none that appealed to me as much as agriculture does. 
And this I am now devoted to with all my soul, he wrote in 1853. What I formerly wished for in sad hours, I have found here. And Mr. Curler and other people, men and women and children from Russia and Belgium, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, Finland and Scotland and so many other places, knew that they were at last home. Now, I would be delighted to take any questions that you might have. I have been asked to remind you that there are microphones on each side of the room. So if you do have a question, it would be helpful if you could step over to one of the mics. first home was like um, on the on the prairie uh, in, in Wisconsin when they would just got there? Sure, I'll do my best. Um, the first homes for the Europeans in particular were often very small square log structures. Um, in a few cases they built the style of home that they had known in the old country and a lot of the Europeans found the environment very, very different in Wisconsin. Many of them left because the landscape was so ravaged where they came from. And the idea of having wood available was just a dream come true for them. So the ideal plot of land for most Europeans was finding a, a farm where they, could, the, where they could create their home that had a little prairie land and some forest land, even though it was very arduous to clear the woods, and often they would clear the woods and turn them into farm fields, but they knew how precious the wood was. So that being the case, with wood available, they would build small log cabins, and sometimes they were one story, sometimes they were two. Some of the woodworkers from Europe were very skilled and did beautiful work with dovetailed corners. Other cabins that, that survived, we know, were put up very hastily, just to, to provide a first shelter. And what usually happened was um, a European family might move into that little cabin. Then once they were sure that all their livestock was well taken care of and they had time and, and money, then they would build a, a larger cabin or a log home. And that first little one room building would be used as a summer kitchen or a chicken coop or whatever they needed. And then ultimately, perhaps a third home would be a frame house some years later. It was much more likely for the Yankees to have a little bit more means. They would start a farm uh, largely on prairie land. They didn't want to clear woods. Um, and so many of the, the earliest homes for them, they might have been cabins, but often also frame homes came up much more quickly. Thank you. Did you discover that many of them went to Milwaukee or Chicago first to make money for their farms? Um, did some of them go to the cities first? Yes, if, often they did. Some of the men um, who arrived first couldn't even get to Wisconsin, even if they knew that's where they wanted to be. And they would work on the eastern seaboard for a little while, save up enough money to get a little farther and a little farther. And then what also happened frequently, uh, especially with some of the later arrivals, but if a family got together but money was still very tight, they would work on their farm in the spring and summer and fall, and then the men would leave for the winter, and they would uh, go up, usually go up to northern Wisconsin or, or the upper peninsula, peninsula of Michigan, and they would either work at a lumber camp or perhaps a mine. So women were often left alone for months on end in the wintertime with their children because that was the only way they could make ends meet. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, in researching my family history, I've noticed that I have uh, some relatives who came from Bavaria um, in the 1850s, and they settled for a short while in New York, and by that I mean like for a year or two or mm. three, and then moved on to the Midwest. And I'm just kind of curious, do you have any theory about what might been, have been going on in that process? Uh, well, it's possible that they knew someone there, uh, either a friend or a relative or a neighbor in, in Bavaria who said, you can stop with me, maybe again work for a little while, see how you like life here. So many of the people who came, they were so hungry for land to farm. 
Um, there just wasn't good land left in so many parts of, of Europe, or the restrictions were so great. Uh, a family might have a farm, but if you were a younger son, you might not be entitled to any of it. So once the very first waves got over, it was really common for people to write letters and say, come here, stay with, stay with us. Um, look around, maybe you'd like to work here, or maybe they needed to work on the docks or find some other kind of labor uh, to earn enough money to get farther on. Because ultimately, so many of them, their real goal was a farm of their own, something they had never been able to own in Germany or Norway or Sweden. Hi. Hi. Could you talk about how they went about making clothing from scratch? Oh, good question, yes. How did they make clothing from, from scratch? Uh, the easiest thing to transport, especially for the Europeans, were flax seeds. Um, flax plants are what provided the fibers to make linen, linen thread, and then ultimately you could weave the linen uh, on a loom. Uh, part of the challenge with flax is that it's a very lengthy thing to process. You can carry this, a sack of seeds, but then you have to separate the, the fibers from the stalks through a, a long series of steps, and then you spin it, and then you still have to weave it. But once you had done that, linen was a good, hardy cloth. Um, having a big loom was a luxury in the early years, so perhaps if one woman in the neighborhood had a, had a loom, she would work out some kind of barter or trade system uh, for other women so that they could either use her loom or she would do weaving for, um, for other people. Uh, the other thing that families wanted to acquire as quickly as they could were a flock of sheep. And they usually didn't come first. First came food animals, chickens um, or pigs. But when they could, they would get a flock of sheep. And the Yankees were such good animal breeders. They introduced a lot of breeds to, to some of the Europeans who didn't know um, all the differences in the, in the types of fleece that the different sheeps might have. For example, merino fleece. You've probably heard of merino wool. Well, it was coveted then, too, because it's such a silky, soft wool. And that became a good cash crop during the Civil War also because the federal government was looking for um, excess wool. Now, one thing that's interesting is that a lot of the immigrants brought mementos from the old country, and most of the beautifully woven tapestries or capes or shawls that we find were brought from the old country. Because in the new country, uh, especially, again, during that first few years, they didn't have time to worry about fancy patterns or dyeing different colors of wool. So th if they could get their sheep, just a few, they'd wash the sheep in the spring in a, in a creek, um, clean the wool, spin the wool, and then knit or weave uh, what they needed from there. Thank you. Any others? Well, again, thank you so much for coming. If you do have any other questions, you can grab me later. And it's just been a delight to share this with you this morning. Thank you. And don't forget there is a book.